Hello, this is Odal, and I'm going to be going over my Sister Freed kill with a plus two weapon. In this case, the Dragon Slayer Axe. Now in phase one, her going invisible is always an opportunity to get in a good amount of damage. If you're paying attention, you should never not know where she's going and where she is. Ideally, she should never do her long wind-up attack from invisibility. Now you want to pay attention to the direction she jumps after going invisible. This is key uh, towards this fight. Uh, when she does her back strafe to go invisible, I start he heading towards her. Because if she follows up with the strafe to left or right, I'm not too far away. If she jumps behind me, I know there's a little bit more time uh, for the wind-up attack. And I will be able to get back to her. Getting the backstab in on her, I circle around her left side until I can see the light brown of her robe under her cloak, and then I do the attack. When getting the backstab in on her, or sorry, with all the backstabs, I immediately get two attacks on her before she fully gets back up. And if you can't get a backstab because she's against the wall or the destructible environment, uh, just swing twice. Get her out of stealth, or not, well, out of her stealth, and get out of the way after you've attacked her twice, because she'll often react almost instantly. Um, there's not a whole lot of attacks otherwise that I try to get damage in. Uh, she has some slower attacks, which are signif signified by an audible sigh coming from her as she's about to swing her size. This is an opportunity to get one or two hits in if you're quick. But when she goes into the stance with the scythe over her shoulder, this is another uh, possible opportunity for damage. How much damage depends on her follow-up. If she does a double spin attack, you can usually roll out of the way once and then walk back into range for one or two attacks. With her grab attack, there's a little less time and a lot more risk. For example, if I get caught by the grab, I die in one hit. But if I'm quick and in the right position, I can get one to two hits. Uh, she does her cone of ice, as you saw a moment ago. Though it's not a very common attack for her to do, but she always follows it up with a quick jump attack. And if you time your roll right, you can easily get in position for one to two hits. Um, possibly even a backstab. Um, like I said, I failed at the opportunity in this part, in this video because. There's a little candelabra in my way. And yeah. That's pretty much all there is to phase one. For phase two, Sister Freed, uh, she mostly just spams her ice cone attack. Um, you don't want to get too comfortable though, because if you're within like two to three weapon lengths away from her, um, she might just decide to attack you. Really, this phase is about trying to manage where Sister Freed is in relation to Ariandel. Now, you'll want to be careful because once you get the boss to about 75 or 80 percent health, uh, Sister Freed likes to cast a heal. Uh, she'll strafe back like in the first phase, go invisible, and then she'll strafe either to the left or right and try to heal usually is probably the more inconvenient spot where she'll try to heal from. Um, this is an opportunity to get in some free damage as long as Ariandel isn't doing something horribly damaging near Sister Freed. Um, I've noticed that once you get them into the range where they need to heal, um, she tries to heal roughly every 60 to 70, 75 seconds. So if, you're, if you want to use a timer, that can help. Otherwise, it's more of a mental like, You can kind of get the sense for when she's probably going to try to heal soon. Ariandel is mostly the same cycle and has the same logic to his attack patterns. There are two types of charging attacks that I'll refer to uh, for the purposes of this video. For, like, for example, right now, I call that the long charge. However, there is also the shorter charge, which is 
about still about closing the distance, but he doesn't. Like right here is the shorter charge, where it looks like he's not trying to spill it, whatever is in that bowl everywhere, but it still closes the gap. Um, so there's kind of a Goldilocks zone where uh, he tends to alternate either between using the fire breathing attack, which is what you want, or doing a long charge. too close though, he'll just do the more various melee attacks. If you're too far away, he'll almost always charge towards you, and that always covers a lot of ground, don't underestimate that. But yeah, the fire breathing attack is where you'll get most of your damage, and by running to a side like this, and trying to get about three or more swings, really. Usually they're going to get at least two, depending on your stamina, and where he is in the attack animation. Now, this fight tends to be pretty tedious because it's really more about the positions. You can get them both in. And because I'm using a low damaging weapon, it's actually a very slow fight. So I'll go over my equipment choices real quick. Uh, one with the Dragon Slayer Axe because if I'm using a character with only up to plus two weapons, Dragon Slayer Axe is phenomenal compared to the other weapons. Now, I use the shield. As you can either see in the future of this video, or you probably already noticed, I haven't used a flask, but I have healed back to full. The shield is just ridiculous with its HP regen. So, I have that, as well as the Sun Princess ring, which just adds more regen. Um, yeah, and it just helps you to manage your flasks. I don't use all of my flasks in this video, or even come close to using them all, but it does help a lot. Uh, especially when you're just still trying to learn parts of the fight. Just the more time that you can spend learning different attacks and how to dodge them, the better. Even if you do end up losing because you run out of flasks. Of course, the armor is just the lightest thing that I can wear, staying at 30% or less. Uh, fast roll, I found to like a lot in this fight. I usually don't even use fast roll because it makes positioning awkward when you roll. Uh, use the hunter ring, it just allows me to use the axe. Um, because I'm using a level 20 character, I'm limited where I can spend my points, so. Really, the hunter ring frees up the space to allow you to, or allows me to have extra vigor, which in this case would be like having plus five vigor. The hornet ring, obviously, like phase one and three, the most of your damage is going to be backstabs. So, hornet ring is comparative there. And then the Karthus blood ring just gives me more eye frame when rolling. Um, I don't know how much this actually helps, because, yeah, I don't, I don't know, it's one of those I suspect it's probably saved me a lot more than the, uh, you know, extra damage that I take has killed me, but it's hard to tell. I, I think if I were to take it off, this battle would have been a lot harder. getting closer to the end. I tend to be a more defensive player, uh, but we're getting closer to the end of the second phase. But because of my play style, I tend to be a little bit more cautious, and it takes a little bit longer.
Let's see. I just finished the second phase. I uh, use an ember just to get the extra health. And yeah. This phase is a lot more intimidating than it is dangerous. Uh, once you've parsed which attacks are opportunities to do damage and which ones you should just dodge, the fight is a lot more manageable. Uh, it's still a very testing phase though. Low damage. I feel like back backstabs are very important in this phase. If you're bad at dodging like me, you'll likely run out of health and flasks before you can whittle down, well, whittle her down, uh, which is normal attacks. She's got the most health in this phase. Uh, jump attacks. Her jump attacks are an opportunity to do damage, but you have to be quick to react and uh, somewhat close in the first place. You don't want to be too far away from. So there are three different jump attacks, uh, but you react the same way to each of them. Move towards her from where, uh, towards where she jumped from. Not like I just did and pulled out of the way. Uh, you'll want to roll once only. When If you're further away, uh, sometimes you can just walk behind where she jumped from if you're close enough. And then sometimes it might help to unlock from her, especially when she does the shadow one, because I think she jumps up a little bit higher than for the other ones, for the ice ones. Uh, when you see the shadows swirling around her as she jumps, it's obvious she's doing the shadow attack. Um, this attack looks like there's a lot more area of effect to it than there actually is. You can basically walk behind her at any point during the animation to get your attack in. When there's no shadow swirling, it's obviously it's going to be one of the ice attacks. There's two different ones. The one you see there is kind of like a circle where she's kind of standing in it slash at the edge of it. Um, you want to be careful because if you're not going in, you want you don't want to go in right as the ice explodes, basically take a lot of damage from it, and it's possible to get in the attack, or a backstab in before the ice explodes, um, as long as you're in those iframes you won't take damage from the explosion. And then the other ice attack is kind of like a fan shape in front of her, she's a lot quicker to react after the attack. But uh... You know, it's not as dangerous to be close to her in that one. So, just look at those as opportunities. Uh, the more comfortable you get with how it, how it works, the less difficult it is to do. I mean, I really wasn't that careful with it, or comfortable with it in this video, as I'd only gotten to this phase like several times before I actually beat it. Um, and as you've probably already noticed, in this phase, her going invisible is once again an opportunity for you. Uh, I do make a mistake here. You do not want to attack her out of her stealth until she does her you know, wind-up attack at the end of it. So, she follows the same pattern. The, the trick is to keep track of where she is when she's invisible, especially since you don't want to attack her out of it. She always does two ice attacks, or little cone attacks she's been doing the entire battle. And then she'll follow it up with a long wind-up attack. When she does this wind-up, if you're close enough, you can get a backstab. The sweet spot kind of looks like you're attacking her side. Almost looks like you're attacking the front of her body because of the way that she's twisting herself. And then, of course, you get in your two extra attacks once you've landed a backstab. And then almost everything else that I didn't just mention, I, I dodge in this phase. She does a double spin that is exactly the same thing as she does in the first phase, but she doesn't do it as nearly as often because she's got so many other attacks she can do. And then, other than that, it's the jump attacks and then her going invisible that you can capitalize on. And you kind of need to, unless you're perfect at dodging her all the time. That's pretty much all the notes I have on this battle. Um, 
obviously I didn't do perfectly, but I did well enough. The goal was to win the battle, not necessarily the challenge. I just wanted to do this with my low-level PvP character. And was very happy that I did. Um, and I see a lot of videos that are like soul level 1 characters. And, you know, the disadvantage to soul level 1 is that you don't have the health. But you can have the damage. And with the low level PvP character, it's often the other way around is that I have the health, but I don't have the damage. So it's. Maybe somebody else out there sees this issue and can learn something from this where it's not the typical soul level 1 fight. Where you have a level 10 weapon, or a plus 10 weapon.
so that was the fight. I uh, hope you enjoyed, and I hope you learned something. And yeah, that's all I've got. Have a good day.